Welcome to episode 25 of my guide to video game history. In this episode we look at the PlayStation 2, the world's most successful console of all time, selling an unprecedented 150 million consoles over an 11 year production life. So sit back and enjoy as we go through this important console. In last episode we saw how in 1998 Sega released their new Dreamcast console, offering a new generation of gaming and wowing the world with its next-gen graphics and online gameplay. The following year, in March 1999, the Sony PlayStation 2 was officially announced by Sony in the Tokyo Concert Hall, and in May that year, in E3, people would finally get to see the new device for the very first time, even if no games were playable. From that moment on, it set the gaming world alight, with its designer grown-up look and its impressive multimedia capabilities, being able to play DVD films, music and games, in all one sleek black box and it could still even play your PlayStation 1 games on the new device. Sony's media department also caused mass excitement through giving such outlandish hyperbole as terms such as the emotion engine that would produce graphics so good that finally we would feel emotions of the in-game characters. By February 2000 the hype had reached fever pitch with playable games finally unveiled at the Sony's own event called PlayStation Festival 2000. And the games on show, particularly Onimusha, really impressed at the time. Such was the anticipation of the new console. It even started to cross over to non-gaming news, with the Newsweek publication this month even giving the impending launch a cover story, a first for any non-gaming national mainstream paper. So, the following month, on the 4th of March 2000, the PlayStation 2 was finally released, and there was mass hysteria over this new device, with it selling 980,000 and consoles in its first week and this number was constrained by the machines available so it's predicted that they could have sold three times that number and it could have even been even more by the end of the month 1.4 million consoles had already been sold in Japan so after so much hype about the machine, on launch the console's game lineup did little to impress, with many promised launch games being actually delayed, as developers were struggling with the new PlayStation 2 console, finding it difficult to program for. And for those games that were released at launch, they did little to impress, not harnessing the console's true power. Some of the best launch titles released at this time was Ridge Racer 5, a gorgeous looking update of that series, although not revolutionary gameplay wise, but still a good fun arcade racer. Then there was Street Fighter EX3, an average beat em up that was the third in the 3D series. To be honest it looked quite uninspiring on the new console, in the graphics department feeling a bit rushed and glitchy, but although not a patch on the 2D Street Fighter games, it was still well received and popular on release. Kesson by Co. meanwhile simply looked gorgeous, and although the stripped down strategy wasn't to everyone's tastes, it did much to show what the console was capable of. The other titles in the launch lineup did little to excite, however, with such titles as Drum Mania, Stepping Selection, Eternal Ring, and A Train 6 hardly console shattering titles. In summary, compared to the Dreamcast, Sega had won hands down at this point in the games department, with Dreamcast games looking so much better than the PlayStation 2 games. But it didn't matter because DVD mania was beginning to take hold in Japan and Sony's box was the cheapest way in. But by September 2000 things were finally starting to improve gameplay wise with the release of Onemusha Warlords, a hack and slash RPG that really impressed at the time, showing what Sony's new beast was capable of. October 26, 2000, Sony would release their console to the US for $299.99, and after so much hyperball, it would cause a lot of salivating on launch day. 
The extra few months had also ensured that 26 titles would be available for gamers on launch in the US. But with such popularity and short supply of the console, it became a big seller on eBay as people who could bought several consoles when available to them and then would sell it on eBay for a thousand dollars making a fortune in the process. The launch games for the US were even more impressive now that developers had had that little bit more time with the machine. With it not only having some of the Japanese launch games, but a stack of new titles as well. Highlights were Dead or Alive 2 by Tecmo, which alongside Tekken Tag Tournament by Namco, did much to offer a compelling alternative to the sterling Dreamcast effort of Soul Calibur. There was also Din Dynasty Warriors 2 by Koei. Certainly this was a great showcase game, looking absolutely fantastic in the graphics department, with a huge number of foes to thwart on the screen at any one time. But gameplay wise it was quite repetitive being simply a hack and slash nature of game and so gamers soon got bored of it. SSX or Snowboard Supercross was perhaps one of the best launch titles offering all that was great about such titles as 1080 degrees but offering it in a more stylized and lavish presentation that only EA can bring to the party. Another great launch title was called Time Splitters and it was done by a newly created development house called Free Radical design who had been set up in 1999 by David Doak after he and composer Graham Norgate had left Rare after the fabulous Goldeneye on the N64 game and during the stressful development of Perfect Dark. For their new game they stuck with what they knew doing another first person shooter with much more emphasis on multiplayer death matches and story. This multiplayer emphasis may have upset some at the time but it was done this way so they could turn around a game quickly enough for the PlayStation 2 launch. The title was great fun and although not the prettiest game on the PS2 it was solid fast and fun and so it became a massive hit. Another two great launch titles for the PS2 was done by developer Angel Software and they did two great games called Smuggler Run and Midnight Club Street Racing. Incidentally both games were published by a new publisher called Rockstar Games but I'll tell you more about this important publisher later on. Angel Software incidentally had already made a name for themselves with one of the first ever open city racers called Midtown Madness on the PC back in 1999. And of course they're better known today as Rockstar San Diego, releasing such hits as Red Dead Revolver and Red Dead Redemption games. But for the PS2 launch titles, their first game they did was called Smuggler's Run. This game offered you an open-ended terrain for you to race around as you picked up and dropped off smuggled goods around a huge open map, offering unprecedented open terrain world for you to explore. The next Angel Studio launch title was the beginning of their long-running series with Midnight Club Street Racing. The game also was an open-ended city but this time had you do illegal street racing across two cities, London and New York. And the game really impressed with its emphasis on having fun, with lots of secret racing shortcuts to find in the game. Over in Europe, the release date was set back from October the 29th, 2000 to November the 24th, 2000, and it sold for £299.99. But even with this delay, only 200,000 units were available available for the region, resulting in a massive flurry of eBay selling again, with massive profits to be made as people sold on the console to people who are rich enough or desperate enough to want one for Christmas. But despite all the excitement over the machine, there'd yet to be a flagship heavy hitting title to make gamers run to the machine, and anticipated titles such as RPG Dark Cloud and the scrolling brawler The Bouncer on release failed to live up to the hype, being huge disappointments. 
The first true AAA title for the console finally came out on the 28th of April 2001 with Gran Turismo A spec. It was released to much anticipation and excitement, taking Kazunori Yamuchi's excellent racing series to its third release. And although having only 180 cars in this game, as opposed to the second game's 650, it didn't disappoint, with it having much more impressive handling and car modelling beyond any car game released at this time, and it's still the most critically rated and popular game in the seminal series. In Japan and Europe in 2002 there was an additional Gran Turismo game called Gran Turismo Concept which allowed gamers to race in unreleased concept cars for the first time. It was a short but welcome addition and even better if you completed this you were given stacks of virtual money in the Gran Turismo 3 game allowing you to finally buy every car. In June 2001 Mr Mosquito was released. This was a delightful and unique game game that had you play a mosquito who must drink the blood of the poor Yamada family who you've taken residence with. The game was a massive hit in Japan and although it did poorly in other regions it's well worth tracking down this unique fun game if you can. The next highly anticipated release was Final Fantasy X, which came out on the 19th of July 2001 in Japan. The game didn't disappoint either, being a lavish affair costing $32.3 million and over a hundred people working on the game. The new game would be the first in the series to have 3D rendered backgrounds as opposed to pre-rendered of the previous. Also this game had full voice acting throughout the game for the very first time. The game was well received, with many publications marvelling at the engaging storyline and graphics, although there were magazines such as Edge that were more critical, giving the game only 6 out of 10, citing the game was too linear and had nauseating dialogue. Incidentally, a 10-2 version of the Final Fantasy game was released in 2003, offering a tandem storyline that was more fun and less somber than the Final Fantasy X game. In May 2002, Square would follow on with Final Fantasy XI. This was a bit of a departure from the norm, with it being a massively multiplayer online RPG, which was enjoyable and well received on release. But for the next instalment with Final Fantasy Fantasy XII, gamers would have to wait all the way until May 2006, but it was well worth the wait, with it being another major update in the series, with it having a glorious story for you to follow. Both Electronic Games Monthly and Edge gave the game 9 out of 10. In July 2001, little-known Finnish-based developer Remedy, who had only at this point released Death Rally in 1996, and are best known today for their Alan Wake game, would leap to centre stage this time with their second game, Max Payne, released in July 2001 on the PC. With ports being admirably handled by Rockstar's in-house developers to bring the games onto the various consoles of the time. In the game you play Max, a former police detective, whose wife and baby daughter is killed by the mob and he goes on a Punisher-like vigilante revenge quest to take down the mob single-handedly. The game was immense, with compelling adult storyline set to some fantastic John Woo stylized slow-down action sequences that made the game so unique to play for the time. The game would see a sequel in 2003 which extended the storyline even further and incidentally Rockstar are currently working on a third game in the series that will hopefully be released in 2013. In August this year Hideki Kamla who had helped create the first two Resident Evil games and better known today for his brilliant Viewful Joe games Akami and Bayonetta but in 2001 he would be begin another famous series called Devil May Cry. Starting out initially as a Resident Evil 4 game, they decided instead to create on a new game series with emphasis on cool stylized combat that had you play Dante as you take on the Legion of Demons. The game was the first of its kind and although perhaps a little repetitive, it was nevertheless an action fest fueled with eye candy that could not be beat. The series would continue in 2003 with a third called Dante's Awakening in 2005. 
Incidentally, a fourth was released on the new current-gen systems in 2008. But for gamers wanting uniqueness, it was without doubt the beautiful Eco released in September 2001 that truly impressed, with its gorgeously stylized graphics and atmospheric game to play like never before. Designed by Fumito Ueda and Capcom veteran Kuji Kado, who had worked on arcade hits for Capcom such as Bond's Adventure and Camel Tree, and went on to do the brilliant Ape Escape games. But for Eco, they would create a beautiful world where you attempt to escape from a ruined castle. What was so special about the game was that there was no dialogue or particularly strict storyline for you to follow, with no display information of health or anything to clutter the screen. All of it had been removed, leaving just yourself in this compelling world, and so it immersed you completely into the game's artistic beauty. A spiritual pre sequel called Shadow of the Colossus was released in October 2005 that maintained and improved on the beauty of the first game. Originally it was called Miko, a play on the word 2 in Japanese, but they would change the name to Shadow of Colossus at last minute. This time the game was even more beautiful, with you playing a young man who must explore the ruined landscape to take out 16 colossal enemies to bring back to life your sweetheart. I cannot express how stunning and immersive these two games are, and I for one am waiting with bated breath for the HD PlayStation 3 revamp of these two classic and often overlooked games, with it being released later in the year. And also, it's not enough, they're coming out with a third title in the series called The Last Guardian, which is scheduled for release next year in 2012. In September 2001, Silent Hill series would come to the PlayStation 2 with Silent Hill 2. The game had you play James Sunderland, who receives a letter from his dead wife, enticing him to the town, Silent Hill. The game is the most terrifying in the long-running series, with the graphics being frighteningly atmospheric on the new PlayStation 2 hardware. The series continued in May 2003 with Silent Hill 3, following a a teenager called Heather this time, who is drawn to the town from a nightmare she has. Next was Silent Hill 4, released in June 2004, which had you play Henry Townsend this time, who's locked in an apartment and discovers it has portals to other dimensions. The series has since continued on with nine other games in the series, and although, in truth, many of the more recent iterations have lost their way from what made the originals so great. But the biggest game on the PlayStation 2 came out in October this year, in 2001, and this was when Scottish-based developer DMA Design released Grand Theft Auto 3 under a new publishing house that would soon rock the gaming world called Rockstar Games, who would go on to become the most profitable and recognised publishing house in the Western world. So before we look at the game itself that made them big, let's first take a little history lesson on how this important publishing house came about. Back in the early 90s, two brothers from London, Dan and Sam Hauser, wanted to get in music production, and so they started work for BMG Music Label, but they found the company full of suits and the job dull. So in 1994, when BMG set up a new gaming division, the Hauser brothers leapt at the chance of this new venture, as they could see there was a real market for more edgier, more adult based games. The first titles that they would release under this BMG interactive label was Firo and Claude in 1996 and Mass Destruction in 1997. These were okay games, but little to set the world in light. But in 1997, the brothers would meet Edinburgh-based developer DMA Design, who had made a name for themselves on the Amiga, producing such hits as Menace, Blood Money, Walker and hired guns before setting the world alight with their game Lemmings. 
released back in 1990. Since then, they had continued with a string of sequels to the Lemmings game, but by 1994, things were becoming a little bit stale in the Lemmings department, and so they wanted to do something different and more adult themed. Their new proposed title was called Race and Chase, which would be an open-ended city where you could do anything, and they would include a mafia fueled plot, giving a storyline to the much wanton destruction in the proposed game. Cygnosis, who had normally produced DMA games, had turned down the proposal, feeling that the game's themes were far too adult for them, and it would cause a, a world of pain for any publisher attempting to release the title. But the Hauser brothers of BMG Interactive, meanwhile, loved the idea, finally feeling they had found that game that they were looking for, and so gleefully snapped up the rights to produce the game. The game was eventually called Grand Theft Auto, and although taking almost three years to write, it would be a huge commercial success, with gamers lapping up this new style of gameplay. But with such long development time to produce the game, DMA were now financially struggling, and so was bought out by Gremlin Interactive in 1997. Gremlin Interactive, meanwhile, were also struggling, so they in turn were bought out in 1999 by Inf- Grams, who would then respectively sell on DMA design to BMG Interactive. Despite the success of the Grand Theft Auto game, it wasn't commercially a big enough hit to turn around the financial woes of the floundering BMG Interactive company, and so they in turn sold on to Take Two Interactive, another new publisher, this time in America, who also wanted to do adult based games and saw with the Grand Theft Auto game they could also achieve that. So in 1999, Dan and Sam Hauser moved from London to New York, the Big Apple, and called their new publishing house Undertake Two. Rockstar. They would work with DMA Design to do a sequel to the Grand Theft Auto games, which was more of the same, but was again popular and sold well. They also brought other development talent under their publishing house at this time, such as Bungie, who produced the OK stylized action game only for them. Rockstar realised, however, that to truly make their mark, they needed to push the boat out in the finance department and do a game with a huge budget. And so they decided to work on a new Grand Theft Auto game with DMA Design, and they would finally decide to set the game out in glorious th- full 3D. So, on to the game itself. Grand Theft Auto 3. This took all that was great about the open ended world of the first two games to be fully in 3D set in a fictional city from the first game called Liberty City which was basically New York in all but name. It finally offered gamers a fully realised detailed city for them to explore while still enjoying all the humour and destruction of what the first games in the series had become known for. The game had gorgeous graphics and the do whatever you want game mechanics in the game won many over to this new title, with the game selling 14.5 million units since its release and becoming the number one hit in both America and Europe, despite the $49.95 asking price. The game was also critically acclaimed, with it being one of the few to get the fabled 10 out of 10 from Edge magazine, and Electronic Games Monthly gave the game 9.33 out of 10. Such a global hit would of course result in the DMA, now called Rockstar North, doing some sequels, but it's testament to the Scottish team that they continually pushed themselves on each subsequent Grand Theft Auto release. The first sequel they did was Grand Theft Auto Vice City, which was released in October 2002, and this time it had you set back in 1986 in Vice City, which is basically Miami in all but name. This was one of my favourite in the series, as by setting it in the 80s and a sun-drenched location, it made me love the game simply for driving around the cityscape, enjoying the Latino music on the radio stations. Incidentally, the game also had a 
cameo of Phil Collins in the game, which was quite good fun. And the game was met again with huge positive critical and commercial success, selling an, an unprecedented 15 million units since release. For the next title in the Fantastic series, they would surpass themselves again with Grand Theft Auto San Andreas, based this time on a California state, with it offering three cities in the game for you to explore, having Los Santos, which was based on Los Angeles, San Fierro, based on San Francisco, and Los Venturas, based on Las Vegas. Set in 1992, the game was amazing, offering a massive open-ended world for you to explore. It also had many innovations to the series, such as finally seamless load times, and the ability to fully customise what you wear. The music as well deserves note, which had been massively increased for this game, with a whopping 11 radio stations for you to enjoy. For many, this was their favourite game in the series, and it certainly was the most popular, with the game being another critical and commercial hit, selling 21.5 million units sold since its release. Incidentally, all of the Grand Theft Auto 3D games used the powerful game engine Renderware, which has made Made by a Guildford, England developer called Criterion Games. They had previously made a name for themselves back in 1999 with Trickstyle on the Dreamcast, but it was in November the 1st, 2001, that they first truly hit the big time with their game called Burnout. This game was a fantastic arcade racer. What made the game so special was a glorious slow motion replays of your crashes, showing it in all its full destructive glory. The game was made with positive reviews, although many critics cited the game's hardness levels was set far too high, making the game unnecessarily frustrating. A sequel called Burnout 2 Point of Impact was released the following year, in September the 30th. This upped the number of tracks in the original and improved on the game's difficulty levels. In September 2004, the world saw Burnout 3 takedown, with Criterion Games now fully in swing and now owned by publisher Electronic Arts. So, for their third release, they would do the most ambitious of the series, offering even more racetracks and with gameplay home to perfection. It goes down as one of the best arcade races of all time. They would continue on the PS2 with Burnout Revenge in 2005 and Burnout Dominator in 2007. Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty was another highly anticipated game release, which finally came out in November 2001. The game by Hideo Kojima impressed as well with its stealth-like gameplay and immersive storyline, and meeting universal and critical acclaim, with Electronic Games Monthly giving it 38.5 out of 40. Hideo would continue with Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater in November 2004, acting as a prequel to the original games, having you this time set in a jungle, which was also a great game in the series. Cambridge, Massachusetts development house Harmonix, meanwhile, which are better known today for their Guitar Hero and Rock Band games, would release their first game in November 2001 called Frequency. This had you control your way through an octagonal tube as you press the buttons in time to the music. Easier to play than explain, it was an underrated gem for music lovers that should be tracked down and played. In March 2003, Harmonix would return with a brilliant amplitude, impressing even more with a rhythm action game. Santa Monica-based developer Naughty Dog Software, which are better known today for their Uncharted games meanwhile, would release another platforming mascot for Sony after their hugely popular Crash Bandicoot games. Released in December 2001, with the game being called Jack and Daxter, the Precursor Legacy. This took all that was great about games by Rare, such as Banjo-Kazooie, and ran with it, utilising the power of the PS2 hardware. A sequel to the game would follow in October 2003, called Jack 2. This changed the gameplay considerably, with more emphasis now on a morph gun, being more of a shooter than a platformer, and it was another major hit. Jack 3 would be released in November 2004, offering even more platform adventuring. 
Finally, a spin-off title, Jack X, would be released in 2005, offering an enjoyable combat racer. SCE Studios Liverpool, meanwhile, which were formerly known as Cygnosis, would release their Wipeout Fusion game in February 2002. This offered a great enjoyable follow-up to the Fantastic series. In March 2002, meanwhile, the world was treated to a marvellous RPG Kingdom Hearts game, joining the talents of Final Fantasy and Square veterans such as Tetsuya Nomura and the licensing characters of Disney. It was a wonderful combination offering gamers a compelling backstory that seamlessly incorporated many Disney cartoon stars without feeling forced. A spin-off sequel was done on the Game Boy Advance in 2004 called Chain of Memories but it would be December 2005 before the PlayStation 2 saw its first true sequel called Kingdom Hearts 2 which impressed even more being larger in scope and with many of the niggles that critics had raised from the first such as camera being sorted out in the second relatively new development studio called Sucker Punch Productions who are better known today for their infamous games on the PS3 would release the brilliant Sly Cooper and the Thievius Raccoonus which used flat cell texture techniques of games like Wacky Racers but incorporated it into a full 3D platform adventure but mixing in stealth as well. The game was critically praised at the time although the game's shortness was highlighted but commercially many missed out on this wonderful game as it got lost in a myriad of other high-profile games being released. Still, it was popular enough to have a sequel in September 2004 called Sly 2 Band of Thievus, which continued the adventures of our favourite raccoon thief. The following year, in September 2005, they would release Sly 3 Honor Amongst Thieves. This was, in my opinion, the best of the series, and I, for one, cannot wait for the next instalment currently being made by them for the PlayStation 3. In October 2002, Time Splitters 2 was released, being the much anticipated follow on from the first brilliant launch game. This time it offered even more madcap characters and levels for you to shoot in. So if ever you feel the desire to be a monkey with a machine gun, then now finally it would be your chance. In March 2005, there would be a third game in the series called Time Splitters Future Perfect, which on release upped the monkey quota even more and improved the game to almost perfection with the title being the ultimate multiplayer shooter for those with a sense of humour. The following month Insomniac Games who had made a name for themselves releasing Spyro the Dragon games would release not one but two platforming heroes for their next game Ratchet and Clank. What made the game so great was its emphasis on weapons as opposed to the usual up close jump mechanics. The game was well received at the time and Ratchet and Clank would quickly become the main mascots for the PlayStation 2. A sequel, Ratchet and Clank Goes Commando, would quickly follow in November the 11th, 2003, improving the game even more, with Insomniac ironing out all the bugs and issues of the first game. The following year, in 2004, would see another sequel, with Ratchet and Clank 3, Up Your Arse Now, which added even more weaponry and levels to the game, making it a massive stonker of a game. But one of the biggest innovations for the PS2 came with, with the peripheral iToy, released on the 5th of March 2003. The device essentially was a webcam, but through clever design by American inventor Richard Marks, it allowed the PS2 games to not only display you in the game, but track your motions as well. At the time of release, such innovations were extraordinary, and it was the beginning of motion control gaming that was to come. Dragon Quest VIII, meanwhile, would be released in November 2004, thankfully showing that the PlayStation hadn't just become a machine for the casual gamer. It had been years since the last one in the series had been released, way back in the PlayStation of those years ago, but the time had been well spent on this sequel, with a glorious looking 2D cell shade RPG by developer Level 5, who are better known today for the Professor Layton games. 
And for those unfamiliar with the Dragon Quest fantasy world, then I can heartily recommend this as a great introduction into that universe and its wonderful delights. Gods of War, meanwhile, was released in March 2005, which had you play the immensely cool Kratos, as he kicks seven shades out of all the Greek mythological beasties that Hades can hurl at him. And in this all-out action platformer, it really showed the true graphical grunt of the PlayStation 2 and what it was capable of like never before. The game was critically loved by gamers across the board and it really gave a compelling reason why gamers shouldn't jump ship to the next gen quite yet. A sequel was released in March 2007 that did the impossible and impressive feat of improving almost every facet of the original game. And it's well worth tracking down these games and having a go if you missed out on this series first time around. The following month in November, Guitar Heroes would be released by Harmonix and Red Octane. The game was a blatant rip-off of Konami's arcade hit, Guitar Freaks, but by cleverly redesigning the look and feel, Harmonix was able to get the rhythm action game to finally appeal to the Western audiences. In 2006, Harmonix, who was bought out by MTV, would go and buy out Red Octane for a cool 100 million. The Guitar Hero games has since gone on to mass commercial success of sales of almost 1 billion units by the third sequel being released and has since gone on to continued success with spin-off games such as DJ Hero and Rock Band. Not bad for a company that's done nothing more really than ransack the talented ideas of Konami's arcade back catalogue. Finally, a quick mention should go to the brilliant and beautiful game Akami by Resident Evil legend Hideki Kamiya, who would direct this beautiful and unique game where you play a wolf spirit who must paint and solve puzzles in this compelling platform adventure. In conclusion, PlayStation 2 is a marvellous machine, being by far the most successful console of all time and that popularity allowed it a wonderful range of games for the machine, introducing many to the wonderful world of gaming. Well, that wraps it up for this episode. Look out for my next episode where we look at Nintendo's continued dominance in the portable handheld market and its attempt to take on the PlayStation 2 with the GameCube. So, until next time, see you later.